You're very welcome to church today. And if you've just stumbled across this YouTube channel for the first time, we hope that you will find this service nourishing to your soul. I have to say that um, this is the first time in months that I've had a shirt on for church. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure what was the appropriate dress code for a service when you know that some of your audience might be still in their pyjamas. So I've gone for uh, a tie with no jacket and I hope that's okay. God, of course, doesn't care very much about what we wear and how we're dressed. He looks into the heart. And it was thinking about having the right sort of heart that made uh, Charles Wesley write our opening hymn shortly after his own conversion. So we'll now sing, O oh, for a heart to praise my God. Thank you to Dennis and Kathy for that. We are now going to come before God's throne in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Almighty, our great God, the heavens declare your glory, the earth your riches and generosity. The whole universe is your temple, and even then it cannot contain the immensity of your presence. And yet, whilst that is true, we, your people, can still know your presence here with us where we are, personal and warm. So we come now to worship and to praise you. For we have come to see that there is no joy in life except in enjoying you. And no hope in life except our hope in you. But when we are in you, our joy is overflowing and our hope stretches out to eternity. We thank you that this is made possible, not because we have earned this blessed state, for we have not earned it and cannot earn it. But it was won for us by your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. He was cast out that we might be brought in. He was trodden down as an enemy that we might be welcomed as friends. He was surrendered to hell's worst that we might attain heaven's best. He was made to bear shame so that we can enter glory. 
He was cast out into darkness that we might have eternal light. By his perfect work, Father, you will forgive all who are sorry and truly repent. So we repent of all our sins, of the things we have thought and done which are against your will. And we repent further of the things that we should have said and thought and done, which were your will, but which we did not do. We are genuinely sorry. Help us, we pray, to turn from sin and to strive to live lives ever closer to your will. Help us to see that if we want to subdue sins, then we must not only labour to overcome them, but we must invite Christ into our lives to fill the space that the sin used to. Help us to grow to hold Christ more dear than the sin and to enjoy living in his presence more than we used to enjoy our sins and lusts. All this we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first reading today is the story of a young man who goes off the rails and gets into what we euphemistically call wild living and whose life falls apart, but who discovers to his amazement that even for someone like him, there is a way back. The prodigal son will now be read for us by John and following that, Heather will share a message, not just for the kids, but for the grown-ups too. The reading is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. The Parable of the Lost Son Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went out and hired himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hard men have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hard men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast to celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Amen.
Good morning. I am so excited to be with you again this morning. Like, give me a wave if you have ever gotten lost. I have gotten lost a few times in my life, but two of those times have something in common. A red arrow. The first time happened whenever I was still in primary school. My dad took my brother and I camping and we decided to go for a walk. Now if you go for a walk, usually there are wooden pillars around that have little arrows on them. We decided that we would follow the red arrow. Somewhere along the way, we must have missed one of the posts. So we couldn't see any more arrows and we thought, we'll be alright, we'll just follow our own route. We must have walked for hours. Now this was way back when I only had wee legs. So this was a really tough job for me to do back then. But after a while we spotted a wooden post and guess what was on it? A red arrow. We were so excited. We thought finally we must be getting back to the end. But actually it turned out that because of the wee detour we had taken there were actually still several more miles to take with this red arrow route. And what made it worse was whenever we thought we were nearing the end there was actually a gigantic mountain that we would have to climb up in order to get back to the car park. Well it probably wasn't really a mountain but after walking around for nearly half a day it certainly seemed that way. But you know what we learned from that walk? We learned to never follow the red arrow again. And I kept to that rule until last week when I went for a walk in Beaver Forest Park and I followed the red arrow for the first time in years and guess what happened? You got it. I got lost again. If it wasn't for Google Maps, I think I would still be walking through those trees today. This reminds me of a story that Jesus told and it's the story of the lost son which you've just been read. For a number of years, the two sons would have been growing up and working on the land for their father. Their father was keeping them on the right path. And that's like following the arrow through life. Then the youngest son decided to do his own thing by asking his father if he could have his half of his father's money. He then left his family behind and went to a different country. He stopped following the arrows and went along his own path. But what can happen when you stop following the arrows? You can get lost. And that's exactly what happened to the youngest son. He lost all his money. He lost all his friends. And he lost his way. For a while he tried to survive by doing his own thing. He worked on a farm with the pigs. And he even considered eating the pigs food. Then he realised something. He needed to get back on the path and follow the arrows. He needed to go home. So he did. And Jesus tells us in this story that his father was waiting for his son to come home and he saw him from a long way off. He ran to meet his son. He hugged him and kissed him and he welcomed him back home. The son had, in a way, made it back to the car park. There are a couple of things that I want you to learn from the story of me and my brother and my dad getting lost and the story of the lost son. The first is this. Even though my brother and I were lost in the forest, my dad was always with us. We might not have been following the arrows, but dad never left our side. And that's the same with God. You might decide that you don't want to read your Bible anymore or you don't want to pray anymore. You might decide that you don't even want a relationship with God anymore. You stop following the arrows that God gives us in the Bible to help us through life and you go your own way. But God never stops loving you and he never leaves your side. Just like the father in the story, God will be watching and waiting for you to turn back to him and come into his open arms. And that leads us on to the second thing that I want you to remember. There is always a way back. We got lost in that forest, but we eventually found the arrows that took us back to the car park. It might have been a longer and a harder journey than we would have wanted or expected, but it still led us back. The son in the story had gone to a different country. He had said and done things that hurt his family. 
but he found his way back and his father didn't love him any less. In fact, his father forgave him. And Jesus was teaching us that it doesn't matter how far you walk away from God, there is always a way back to him. And that's because God's love and forgiveness are so much bigger than we can ever understand. So let's thank God for his love now as we pray. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for the Bible which gives us arrows to help us through life. Thank you that even when we ignore the arrows and go our own way, you are still with us, just waiting for us to come back into your arms. Thank you that you love us more than we can ever understand. Help us to stay on the right path, but if we do get a little lost, help us to remember that there is always a way back to you. In Jesus' name, Amen. So be careful when you're out going for your walks, and if you are following the red arrow, be extra careful. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Shepherd loved them so But one got lost inside a deep ravine And didn't know how to get home The shepherd sought the one who strayed And wouldn't rest till he could say
Thank you very much to Heather for another thoughtful message. Adrian is now going to lead us in our prayers for others. Let us come before the Lord our God in prayer and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. Thanks that we have the freedom to come before you in prayer, to be able to spend time thinking of the needs of others. And we do so now. We especially pray for those who need healing, healing in their lives, in body, in mind, in soul, in relationship, in whatever form they need healing, we pray for it now. We pray it in the name of Jesus and we ask you, Lord, to reach out and to touch and to heal and to restore people who need your healing touch upon their lives. We can picture them now in our mind's eye and we bring them before you. Lord, bless them, touch them, heal them and restore them. In the name of Jesus we pray. And Lord, we think of those people who are lost, who are outside your kingdom. Lord, people whom we know in our families, in our circles of friends at work, people who have heard and not believed and people who have not even heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, people who are lost to your kingdom. Lord, we pray for them. We pray, Lord, that they might yet hear and believe and be saved. We pray it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we think of our province and our country and the greater world in these sad and distressing and worrying times of this pandemic, Lord, we think of people, people who have been affected by it in different ways. And as we prepare to come out of this pandemic, Lord, we pray that people would be restored, that courage might be apparent that there would be a return to normality, albeit a new normality. We pray, Lord, that people would have courage to come out, that people would be encouraged to return to their way of life. Lord, we think of these times now. Help our leaders to make good decisions as we come out of this lockdown and as we prepare for a new way of living our lives. We pray, Lord, for the government, for the leaders of our nation and of nations across this world. Lord, we pray that good times would be restored again. We pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. And Lord, we believe, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that as we pray, so you hear and respond. And Lord, we know that lives have been touched and changed and transformed because of our prayers this morning. And so, Lord, we make these our prayers and we offer them to you and we do so in and through the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Over lockdown, we've had a number of readings from Isaiah and we're going to look at another passage today. The first part, the first half of Isaiah contains many warnings to the people to change their ways and to repent, with warnings about what will happen if they don't. The people, of course, don't repent. And in the latter parts of the book, Isaiah, who foresaw the exile, began to leave messages which would comfort the people in exile and direct them in their recovery. He says things like, comfort, Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and her sin has been paid for. What hasn't been explained so far is how their sin has been paid for. But now in this famous passage which Valerie will read for us, God reveals his plan. The reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 52 verses 13 to 15 
and Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 to 12. The Suffering and Glory of the Servant See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred by yawned human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. The Israelites in exile were going to need words of encouragement, for the Babylonians were barbaric conquerors. Uprooting the people that they had defeated and moving them to other parts of their empire was just part of their strategy for breaking their spirits. People in those days often associated their gods with their lands and where they were from, and some of them may have doubted whether their gods could even reach them once they had been moved somewhere else. The Israelites, I think, will have believed that God could have reached them, for they believed that he had made the whole world. The prophet Jonah tried to get away from God by crossing the sea. But even he knew that this this wasn't really going to work. And in the storm, he, he said to the sailors, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And he might have been realizing at that point how foolish it was to try to get away from a God who had made the sea by crossing the sea. As the Israelites marched into exile, they had plenty of time to despair about their situation. Google tells me that the walk from Jerusalem to Baghdad, if you were to do it today, and Baghdad's close to where Babylon was, would take about 224 hours. 
or three weeks of walking. On that journey, they might have believed that God could still reach them, but they may have wondered whether God would even want to. They had the words of the prophets ringing in their ears. And the message that they had ringing in their ears was essentially that everything they had been doing for generations meant that they deserved this. Isaiah 5 compares Israel to a vineyard. We read it a few weeks ago. It says that God came to the vineyard looking for good grapes and found only bad ones. More graphically, that he came looking for justice and found bloodshed instead. The first chapter in Isaiah outlines their sins. It says their rulers had loved bribes, which condemns the rulers. But it condemns the people too, because they were the ones paying the bribes, hoping to get an advantage by doing so. And sometimes you will find that people don't really mind a corrupt system if they think that they're the ones benefiting from it. God sees all this. Another thing in Isaiah 1 is that it says that they do not defend the cause of the fatherless. The widow's case does not come before them. God looks at a people and judges them by how they treat the weakest and most defenceless among them. Isaiah 1 also says, You will be ashamed because of the sacred oaks alluding to how the people had abandoned God and experimented with pagan rituals. God looks at a people and judges them by how they have treated him. The Israelites had all these words from the prophets with them as they lived in exile. Their past sins were documented. All the warnings they had ignored were there. And they were reminded of their guilt every morning as they got up to work for their Babylonian masters. Knowing that the best of everything they produced belonged to their masters and they would get whatever was left over. They knew how they had gotten into this mess. They knew what they had done to deserve it. And surely, surely now there was no way back. Was there? Except, of course, that the words of Isaiah and the prophets were not just words of condemnation. All through their words, there were these recurring messages of hope that God would one day restore them. From chapter 40 onwards, Isaiah has really been focusing on this message. Comfort my people, he says. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Her sin has been paid for. Now Isaiah was long dead before the exile started. But he saw it coming. And in the latter part of his book, God gave him a message left during his lifetime and remembered by his disciples. But a message that the people of his day weren't ready to understand. So it was a message that was waiting for the people to become ready to listen. And it said this. It said that with God there is a way back. With God you can be forgiven. It said you have wandered off the pathway but God is going to put you back on it. Everything can be as it was supposed to be. And this broken mess will be swept away. That message was there in Isaiah, waiting for the people to be ready to hear it. And it's in our Bibles today, waiting for when we're ready to hear it. Isaiah says things in in the chapters coming up to what we have read, like um, it says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. In chapter 41, it says, I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. And in chapter 42 it says, I will take hold of your hand. 
I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison. You can imagine people sitting in exile thinking about this. Some of them probably hearing these words for the first time. And they must have asked, can, can this be true? They were hardly daring to hope. They asked, how? Isaiah 40 says that Jerusalem's sin was paid for. And maybe that phrase just passes over us. For we've had the idea, the Christian idea, that sins can be cancelled for 2,000 years. But the Israelites in exile might just have asked how. Who paid? Did someone else pay? Or could we somehow have paid for it ourselves by our exile and by our time of suffering? That would have been a very precarious sort of redemption for them. If they had paid it themselves by suffering and exile, what happened when they got home again and sinned again? Would they have to be exiled again? Would Jerusalem have to be destroyed all over? No, God had a better solution than that in mind. The passage we read sounds like witnesses talking in hushed and wandering voices about this thing that they have seen. Their testimony is about God's servant, how he was despised and rejected, how he was righteous and there was no deceit in his mouth, which is all true of Jesus. And in awe they describe how he took their pain. And they are talking about themselves because although the voices in this passage readily admit that they did not recognise the servant, for he didn't look how they would expect God's anointed to look. Yet they see it now, that this appalling, marred, disfigured person bore their guilt and was punished for the wrong that they had done. This message to these Hebrews just over two and a half thousand years ago was that their sins could be paid for because God was going to provide someone who could pay the bill. And by this he would make a route for them back to their land, but more than that, back to their God. In spite of all their feelings and even in spite of their future feelings, this is a secure redemption because it has been provided by God. And it wasn't just a message for the Israelites. It says this servant will sprinkle many nations. The Israelites represent us in the story. For we go astray just like them. But the message of hope applies to them and to us today. It is a promise of hope that prodigal sons everywhere can lift themselves out of the pigsty and come home. No matter what they've done or how long they've been away. It is a message for all generations to all people everywhere. But maybe today's generation is sceptical. They say... We think your talk of sin is outdated. Your idea of sin is some sort of complex on the brain. And your, your obsession with punishing it is quite barbaric. Now, since we don't accept your idea of sin, and we consider your idea of punishment crude and uncivilised, we don't have any need for your offer of redemption whatever that is. What do we say to a challenge like that? Is it too strong an argument to be clear off? I think we have to say, 
with a raised eyebrow, oh really? Because it simply isn't true. The idea that modern people don't believe in sin and punishment doesn't stand up to any scrutiny. If you've looked on Twitter today to see what people think, then it's completely laughable. You will see online today sins being condemned in the strongest possible terms. There you will see the inquisitors of the modern age hunting out and exposing wrongdoers, tweeting against them. And when they find one of these sinners, they might not call them sinners, but that's what they mean. You can be sure that they want to see them punished. And they want to see them punished with frightening speed. They're not prepared to wait. I'm not talking here specifically about people on the left or people on the right. Because whilst they might have a different idea of who who is a sinner, they, they basically think the same things. It doesn't really matter if you're a hang em and flog em sort of person who, who, who wants the bodies locked up forever, or better still, sent to the electric chair. Or if you're a campaigner who wants to hunt down everyone who has ever said anything politically incorrect. And then when you find them, you want them stacked and chucked off TV and everything they've ever done censored. No matter which side you're on, you've got a very clear view about the people who you consider to be the baddies. And make no mistake, Twitter and the world today believes that there is such a thing as sin and it wants to see sin punished. Our culture today believes in goodies and baddies. And it's a bit scary how quickly it's prepared to move someone from the, the goodie category into the baddie category. Do we in the church agree with this? Surely we're the ones who've been talking about good and evil for thousands of years. So isn't it great that the rest of the world has finally caught up. Well, I mean, once upon a time, there was sort of a view that the world that tried to ignore God just pursued hedon hedon that's a big word, hedonism and pleasure. People just tried to have fun and didn't think about good and evil. And maybe now they've progressed a bit. They've moved far enough to recognise the sin that exists in the human heart. You could call that progress, but it seems that they've mostly spotted sin in other people's hearts. They've not looked at themselves and they've not really discovered anything new. David, writing in Psalm 14, had spotted the problem thousands of years ago when he wrote, there is no one who does good, not even one. But whilst today's culture can put you in the baddie bucket very quickly, it doesn't seem to know how to move people in the baddie bucket back out of it again. The secular ideas that are rapidly taking hold of our world have no way or plan to make a sinner good again. To use religious language, they have no doctrine of redemption. Indeed, the world today doesn't really care about redeeming people who it classifies as bad. Because if you only consider other people to be bad, you don't really have to worry very much about redeeming them. How does that work itself out? Well, if you follow the news today, almost automatically, as soon as a judge passes down a sentence in a court case for any serious crime, a petition springs up online calling for the sentence to be made longer. And I'm not saying that bad people should never go to jail. Of course they should. But I think sometimes in my heart, I have to hope that eventually 
they will become less bad and get out of jail and live a better life. And I don't see that aspiration in this obsession with locking people up for longer and longer. Equally, there was a case in the news recently of a 24-year-old man who organised a banner to fly over a football match saying white lives matter. He was shortly after sacked from his job as a welder in an engineering firm. I don't know the details of this case, but often companies react to online campaigns and petitions to sack the body. But if a man who is guilty of thinking the wrong things at the age of 24 is too unclean to work as a welder, how is he to be made clean again? It's not clear that there's a plan out there for that. Is he so unclean that he must never be allowed to work again? And if so, what do people think will happen as he sits at home by himself? Will his thoughts and views become better or worse? If we stop looking at other people for a second and look at ourselves and into our own hearts, what do we see? If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. That's Psalm 130. The psalmist knew a thing or two about looking into their own hearts. And they knew all too well what they found there. And so did Isaiah, who at the start of his ministry cried, Woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah recognises his own sin first, and then everyone else's. He's not blind to that either. But although Isaiah, throughout his career, points to the people's sin, he doesn't pretend that he's removed from it. He identifies himself with them. Better than that, God has not removed himself from the people either to just point his finger at them. Through the book, God, through Isaiah, works through this problem to find a way back for his people. And now in chapters 52 and 53, he presents his solution to both justly punish sin and to mercifully let us go. I am not good enough to live by a rule that condemns the bodies and offers them no way back. That's why I hide myself in Jesus and take shelter beneath his cross. We, we should seek out the path which picks up even the worst of sinners and instead of condemning them, makes them clean again. For the message of the Christian gospel is that no matter what you've done or how bad you've been, there is always a way back to God. Our closing hymn was written by John Newton, a slave trader, one of the worst of the worst. But even for someone like him, there was a way back. There was forgiveness when he came to his senses. And so he could write the words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We're going to have that hymn sung for us now by the Cairns Hill Worship Group. Thank you very much to them. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. 
found was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fear And we close now with our benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour who alone is wise be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear relieved oh precious dear that grace appeared the hour I found
Great. 